I welcome you all to our hearing on small business and micro business. Uh, I'm Council Member Mark Jaronite, Chair of Committee on Small Business, and I'd like to welcome you to our hearing. Thank you for making time for us today. Some of the most famous names in American businesses, like Apple, Walt Disney, and Mattel, started with a couple of dreamers and a few blueprints in a dusty garage. Even now, though most of us don't have spare garage space, we can make use of micro-businesses or employers with less than 10 employees. Lying in the heart of, city of New York City's economy, according to the Empire State Development Corp. There are more than 650,000 people who work at these type of firms within the five boroughs. This hearing will focus on the services that SBS is offering to early stage mom and pop retailers, enable them to grow, survive, and thrive in a highly competitive 21st century economy. The independent restaurants, grocery stores, and dry cleaners that are struggling to survive today could be engines of local hiring and neighborhood re revitalization tomorrow. To ensure the city has access to comprehensive and user-friendly data on which to base its policies, we will be considering a piece of legislation that I have sponsored, Intro 1000, love the number by the way, which would require SBS to report on a number of micro-businesses registered and doing business in New York City. I'm excited to hear from the administration and from advocates on the viability of this proposal and gather more ideas on ways the city can support the businesses that provide the character of our neighborhoods. I'd like to thank the committee staff, Council Irene, Policy Analyst Michael, as well as my Chief of Staff Reggie and my Legislative Director Darden for their work in making the hearing possible. Finally, I'd like to recognize the committee members that will be joining us at some time <coughs> during this hearing. We have Council Member Ayala with us. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Chair Jonai and members of the Committee on Small Businesses. Uh, my name is, is it on? Well, do we have to swear you in now? I just have to swear you in Oh, first. I'm so sorry. No Move problem. Part so we can hold you I apologize, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> So do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but, but the truth in your testimony before the, this committee and respond honestly to the council member questions? I do. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, Chair Joe and I and members of the Committee on Small Business. My name is Cynthia Kaiser and I am the Chief of Staff at the New York, at the New York City Department of Small Business Services. At SBS, we aim to unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting them to quality jobs, building stronger businesses, and fostering thriving neighborhoods across the five boroughs. Today, I am pleased to testify on Intro 1000, a bill to define and report on the number of micro-businesses in New York City. On a personal note, it was a pleasure to join uh, Chair Joe and I to walk uh, the Arthur Avenue corridor this small business Saturday, this past weekend. SBS strongly agrees that micro-businesses are essential to the local economy and character of every neighborhood. In New York City, micro-businesses make up nearly 80% of businesses and employ approximately 15% of the private sector workforce. These companies cover many industries, ranging from retail to professional services to food services. They also contract with the City of New York. More than 75% of city-certified minority and women-owned businesses, MWBEs, are micro-businesses. While the number of micro-businesses across the country has decreased by approximately 16%, micro-businesses in, micro in New York City have grown by more than 10%. We continue to work towards fostering that growth through small business resources, including workshops, courses, access to financing, capacity building, technical support, workforce training, emergency preparedness, and contracting opportunities with the city. All of these services are offered for free at either our New York City Business Solutions Centers or Workforce One Career Centers located throughout the five boroughs. Through the work of our Chamber on the Go and Compliance Advisor teams, along with our new mobile outreach unit, SBS is also able to reach business owners who are too busy running their businesses to stop into our centers or attend a workshop. In addition, SBS recently launched two new programs, Love Your Local and the Commercial Lease Assistance Program, to help both longstanding and other small businesses adapt to changes in the retail environment. Love Your Local was created to support longstanding legacy businesses as they navigate changing market conditions. This program celebrates and promotes the diverse, independent small businesses that enrich our neighborhoods across New York City and encourages New Yorkers to share their favorite non-franchise businesses on an interactive online map. Business owners have an opportunity to, 
to apply for business advisory consultations, and eligible business owners were able to apply for grants of up to 90000 Since launching, our two over 2,000 businesses have been added to the Love Your Local map, and 50 businesses have received initial assessments. To support businesses that are facing issues with their lease leases, we provide free legal representation through our commercial lease assistance program. Our pro bono attorneys help businesses with signing a new commercial lease, amending, renewing, or terminating an existing lease, negotiating on behalf of the commercial tenant with their landlord, and providing advice and referral services when litigation cannot be avoided. This new program, which launched in February, has already served approximately uh, 250 businesses. The Commercial Lease Assistance Program builds on our prior and continuing work with commercial lease education workshops to help business owners better understand the components and implications of signing a commercial lease. The administration has also worked closely with City Council to further assess small businesses by raising the threshold of the commercial rent tax. On average, 2,700 small businesses will save about $13,600 a year due to the leadership of City Council and Mayor de Blasio. This change will help small businesses save more money to renovate, expand, and hire new employees and grow their businesses. The city also has also committed to make the, the regulatory environment easier for small businesses. Regulations are important to ensure health and public safety, but they should be fair and not overly burdensome to businesses. That is why three years ago, Mayor de Blasio challenged his deputy mayors and regulatory agencies to reduce the regulatory burden on the business community Following an extensive eight-month outreach effort to hundreds of businesses, the city launched Small Business First, an interagency initiative to make government more effective and efficient in helping businesses start, operate, and expand. Based on stakeholder feedback, the city developed 30 commitments with four key objectives. To provide clear information with coordinated services and support, to help business owners understand and comply with regulations, to reduce the burden imposed by complex regulations and fines, and to ensure equal access for all business owners. As we complete our commitments for Small Business First, we are continuing to source new ideas and continuing our work with regulatory agencies to identify ways to ease the burden on businesses. For example, since the start of this administration, DCA has reduced fines to small businesses by more than 50%. With the support of Council, this administration also oversaw the implementation of the CURE Law, which allows business owners to correct many first-time violations. SBS is committed to better understanding the needs of microbusinesses and providing them with essential services. To that end, SBS supports the intent of Intro 1000 and would like to work with Council to develop a method to best collect this data. Currently in New York, businesses are incorporated at the state level and are not required to register with the city. This makes it difficult to determine if a business is independently owned and operated, not dominant in, field, in its field, or, it has, or if it has nine or fewer employees as laid out in the bill. SBS believes that collecting accurate data is a vital first step in the creation of impactful programming, and we have been exploring ways of collecting accurate and up-to-date information. We agree that collecting information on businesses would allow us to better understand the needs of small business owners. One method that has been proposed is the creation of a storefront registry, which would allow the city to collect better data on commercial properties. We are working closely with the administration and the Department of Finance to determine the design and implementation of a potential storefront registry. And I'll note that our colleagues from the Department of Finance are here today to answer questions uh, on that aspect as well. SBS is an advocate for small and micro businesses and we are committed to ensuring that they succeed in New York City. Our role is to serve as a resource <coughs> to all business owners, no matter where they come from or what barriers they face. Although we are proud of our current accomplishments, there's always more to be done. We look forward to learning more about the businesses in all of your districts and partnering with you to help them grow. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I am happy to answer any questions from members of the committee, and I am joined as well by Warren Gardner, who's our Director of Intergovernmental Affairs for the Department of Small Business Services. Thank you. Thank you. We've also been joined by Councilman Perkins, and I'll just begin with some questions from your testimony. Uh, and I'll begin with SB1. SB1 was formed, I believe, a little over three years ago, going on our fourth year. Uh, in 2015, I believe, yes. 2015. So yes, correct. Um, I believe the cost from the last hearing that we had was about $27 million. Has that number increased? As um, far as it's I, the, the cost was $27 million? Of SB1. 
Um, I'm not sure I can check on the, the budget of the program. That would be great. How close have you come to meeting your objectives, the four points that you point out initiated SB1? Uh, the city is nearing completion of the 30 commitments, and we believe that in aggregate, uh, the completion of this initial round of small business first it has helped to meet those four objectives. I think that the city can always be doing more, and we're working with our partner agencies and certainly happy to work with the council to continue that work. I believe over three years and $27 million, and that number I'm sure has grown, and one of the four points was to reduce the burdens imposed by complex regulations and fines. Correct. We're still not sure if there are 5,300 5, or 6,000 rules and regulations. But in a three years time, I believe 80 rules and regulations have been modified. So it's intent to get rid of outdated regulation has not you have not met your objective. I believe that uh, the city of New York has been extremely ambitious in the Small Business First Initiative and that we have met our aims uh, to help save businesses time and money um, in both starting and operating their businesses. So overall, the Small Business First Initiative has saved businesses uh, over $18 million um, and uh, businesses a month and a half in time to open, which is significant for a business owner trying to um, get started and begin earning revenue and begin hiring staff. So I think that we have met our aim as the city. Um, that being said, to your point, and I know you've always been um, an extremely strong advocate on business regulation and ensuring that there are no unnecessary burdens for small businesses, um, we look forward to continuing the work of, with our partner agencies. It doesn't stop as these 30 commitments are completed, but I think that we have met our aims in terms of saving businesses time and money. Sounds great. Time and time again, year in and year out, um, from one administration to another, we've heard the same things from small businesses. It's the regulations as the, one of the top three complaints. In three years, to modify 80, which means you made it more complicated, when small businesses are struggling to keep their doors open, after spending $27 million, and I keep going back to that number, three years, $27 million later, of the alleged 6,000 rules and regulations, this agency, this administration, has modified 80. Uh, this administration uh, took up the charge when the mayor was elected to bring together partner agencies to task all of uh, his deputy mayors to look at all the regulations across the city and determine which ones could be streamlined and how to improve uh, uh, processes across the city. So for example, we've trained our city staff at regulatory agencies to ensure that they provide better customer services to those businesses. You're absolutely right. We heard that as a concern from small businesses. We haven't, we've done, it's, it's all rhetoric, and I don't want to cut you off, but it, it sets the tone. And on paper, it looks great. The commitment isn't there, because we haven't done anything to alleviate the burden. I am chair now for going, going on 10 months, roughly. I'm still waiting for the 6,000 rules and regulations to be provided to me in an easy to read, trans Parent manner. How are small businesses supposed to comply with rules and regulations that they can't even obtain from the city of New York? We at the Department of Small Business Services uh, developed a program with um, two separate sets of staff who work with small businesses directly to help them understand regulations that apply to those businesses. One of our program's compliance advisors have served over 4,000 small businesses since uh, that program began. Those are staff members who go directly to businesses and say, here are the common violations for a business of your type. That's the key word, common, by the way, because it covers the top 10. It doesn't cover, uh, I'm going to ask you a straightforward question. What is the number of rules or regulations that small businesses, micro businesses, mom and pops have to comply with in the city of New York? 
I think that's a complex question, while it may seem like a simple one, because various uh, small businesses from different industries experience different issues. We heard um, at the beginning of our small business process that Department of Buildings and Department of Health and Mental Hygiene had regulations in their compliance visits that were difficult for businesses to understand or to prepare um, for the inspections and become compliant. That's in no one's best interest. We all want businesses to be compliant so that customers have health and safe um, interactions with that business and the business owner doesn't uh, incur any fines or they do. have time to <laughs> open issues. So we think we've taken significant steps as an administration through programs like those compliance advisors that really have made a meaningful difference. I'm not here to say that everything is perfect, but I think that um, I, I would contest the idea that, that nothing significant has been done because I think the small business first effort is um, a significant marquee effort from this mayor to really uh, correct issues uh, that had existed with those regulatory agencies and I think um, we've, we've taken significant to strides to help those small businesses. So Scott Springer comes out with a uh, red tape commission several years ago. It says there are 6,000 rules and regulations that mom and pop shops have to comply with. That's the, that's the report that was provided by Scott Springer. We have, we have not seen anything contrary to that. I hear numbers from 50, it's not 6,000, it's actually 5,300. I say, great, can I see these rules and regulations and let's count them together since apparently calculators don't all work the same way. I'm not getting that. And not, if I'm not getting it, let's, uh, I would imagine we could both agree that whether it's 5,300 or 6,000, that's a large number of regulations that have to be complied with. Can we agree on that? We can agree that if it's 6,000, that's a large number of regulations. What I would say is that there are health and safety regulations that I think we would also agree are important for businesses to comply I with. I didn't say we need zero. Right. We know that we Absolutely. need rules and regulations. Absolutely. So but 6,000 is a large number of regulations to comply with in particular with micro businesses. Mm -hmm. For the Department of Small Business Services, we're most interested in having a business owner understand the regulations that apply to their business and help them navigate through that process. That's so a great point. So if you don't have the six, it, it, for you to help would mean you have to understand the 6,000 rules and regulations. If you don't have the 6,000 rules and regulations, how are you going to possibly help? a local florist, a local pizzeria, a lo local bodega, if you yourself, as the agency responsible with this task, don't have them. We are able to help those small businesses, to your point, retail businesses, restaurant businesses, uh, to help them to be compliant. We have compliance advisors and client managers. Client managers will work with a small business to hold their hand through any regulatory process to help them interact with regulatory agencies. Um, I think under this administration, there's really been uh, the directive from the mayor himself to say to regulatory agencies that we all need to work together to ensure that we're helping small businesses. Um, that's really been shown through Small Business First Report, through the creation of the NYC Business Portal. That was an effort to get all information re relevant to small businesses online in one place. That was no small effort. A small business owner can go online now and see all the regulations that apply to their business type because to your point, there, there are regulations across the city and across agencies. Not every small business has to comply with all of those regulations. We help them to understand the regulations that apply to them. Um, we do that in person, through client managers, through compliance advisors. If a business owner um, has trouble connecting with those staff, we make it very easy, but you can go online and see the uh, regulations that apply to your business. Um, so I think we've really taken a significant step to be customer friendly when the customer is a small business owner um, and to ensure that we are coordinated across the city and we're working together uh, so that we can really think through um, any issues that may arise for a small business and make our own processes and procedures as uh, easy as possible. We have inspectors going out with handheld um, devices so that all of our data can be coordinated. We have trained our staff so that they can be better customer service, uh, service provide better customer service. We're translating our guides, we're putting our information online, we're creating these new <coughs> tools and resources. So um, 
I think that we are taking steps as a city to make improvements in this area. I didn't want to focus on SB1. This year was supposed to be about something else, but you put it into your testimony, and I'm going to ask you that question again. Are you going on the record saying that, based on the industry, you will help that small business understand every rule and regulation in the city of New York that they must comply with? I want to hear a yes or a no based on what you just said. Based on industry, are you going to make that small mom and pop shop aware of the rules and regulations that they must comply with? We work with small businesses to ensure they understand the compliance, the rules and regulations that apply to their business. Yes. So you're I'm not sure that I understand the based on industry piece. I apologize. Well, because the 6,000 rules and regulations don't apply to e every small business. It depends on the industry. And if I'm going to open up a pizzeria and I contact, contacted SBS, are you going to be able to identify all the rules and regulations that I have to comply with so I don't find myself in violation and subjected to a fine? Um, thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. I look forward to uh, eating at your pizzeria. We, um, we will go to your business and help you understand the regulations that apply to your pizzeria. We'll do that in a few ways. One, by talking through the most common violations and ahead of common, an inspection. So, mm -hmm. But we will also work with our agency partners to help you understand all the regulations that apply. That could be through compliance advisors, but also client managers through our website, through our other services. So yes, so we will I, help I, you I'm to understand. A, a, I really want to be a good partner in New York City, and I want to do right by my customers, my future customers, Absolutely. but I also want to do right by New York City and make sure that my business is in compliance. And l you keep referring to common violations, and the uncommon violations that I'm still required to comply with is my question. So of the 6,000 rules and regulations, until I hear otherwise, that's the number I'm going to have to use, are you going to prevent me or help me complying with all of the rules and regulations as I open up my new business? Not the common, each and every rule and regulation. Absolutely. So you can assure me that if I met with you and we did our walkthrough and you brought to my attention all the rules and regulations in an easy to read, transparent manner, there's no reason for me to be in violation of anything. I want to be clear that what we will do as the Department of Small Business Services and what we will do as the City of New York is ensure that you have access to that information. Access. So, okay. I, I've and been given have, access to that. I've been given access to the 6,000 rules and regulations. I can't make hay of it. And I consider myself to be pretty knowledgeable and uh, intelligent and I can read and to use the portals and take you from one department to another department to come back to the same department and the subcat. I can't figure it out. These are mom and pop investors that have put their, their life savings on the line. And they're focused on keeping their doors open, satisfying their customers and paying the electric Your fines and violations, when I say yours, because you're part of the administration, prevent me or prevent them from conducting business and focusing on their business because your fines and violations come with big numbers. I cannot prepare for a $5,000 hit on the simplest of violations which I've brought up time and time again. The signage laws, which are outdated. They date back to 1961, and n I shouldn't say none, but very few, if any, businesses comply with the current signage law. And it starts with a $5,000 violation. I asked for a simple moratorium from this administration on issuing those violations, subjecting to subjecting those small business owners to a $5,000 fine. 
until we can address it. I can't get that done. There is no willingness here. So on paper and rhetoric, it sounds great that we want to be partners and we want to make sure our small businesses flourish. The simplest of violations that if you looked at any commercial corridor, it's visible there is zero compliance. This administration has yet to embrace it and say, you know what, this is unfair. It really isn't fair that we've allowed a violation, that we've allowed the signage laws not to be complied with citywide, and we are hurting small businesses on an outdated piece of legislation which says no more than 12 square, foot, square feet of print. Zero ambition to truly address an issue that is hurting small business, because it's not the 5,000. Then they have to take down the sign and to put up a new sign and bring an architect, an engineer. I've been told the numbers are as high as $20,000 with one rule and regulation of the signage. Well, that leaves me a question. What are the other 5,999 rules and regulations that that pizza owner must comply with if only one of them can cost 20,000? We are the problem. We are a part of the problem. And we are not helping with solutions. Can I get a commitment from you a real commitment for those small businesses that you will look into this signage law and perhaps put a moratorium that was in place before this administration back until we can have a comprehensive approach to this single violation. I can absolutely tell you that the Department of Small Business Services is part of conversations <coughs> on ensuring that um, we can help businesses to comply with the existing laws, but also to look at the laws and try to... I'm asking help. this one, please. Stay and with me on this. I this can commit one. to small business services being a part of those conversations, yes. Dana. We've been joined by Councilwoman uh, Rivera. Uh, let me allow some of my colleagues to ask the questions. It just makes it so difficult. It's like pulling teeth. I'm not a dentist, and I know that it's difficult for you to answer and make a commitment. But when we have small businesses out there and we know that they're backbone, they are the true engine of our economy. And for those that are listening in on this hearing, and they're here in the dialogue where I'm asking a straightforward question about just one of the rules and regulations that there is truly hurting small business. And we can't get a we don't have the appetite. They know that we're not a real partner. We're their hurdle. I would respectfully disagree that there is not an appetite okay. to work with small businesses and to work across this administration, across regulatory agencies, to streamline regulations where possible, to ensure that small businesses can understand regulations. I think we've done that through a number of tools, I think, to, to your earlier question, um, and I appreciate uh, the discussion of signage in particular, but I think that uh, we, we not all small business owners uh, take in information the same way, so we try to develop tools that can help businesses, no matter where they are, what kind of business they run, um, and how they best uh, understand the information that we provide. So we provide some of that information online through the online portal. We'll come to your door and help you with compliance advisors or client managers. We've created uh, materials in different languages. We at SBS have worked with agency uh, staff at other agencies to help train them and give them our knowledge on small businesses and likewise for them to train us on some of their regulations. So I do think that this administration has taken uh, really significant and meaningful steps to help small businesses. It's not to say that that there isn't more to be done. Um, we look forward to participating in more conversations with agencies about regulations that still may need more help on the education side or on the reform side. Um, but I I want to dispute the idea that we are, are not paying attention to this issue because we so, are. Um, small businesses 
don't want dialogue. They want action. And I'm voicing their concern to you, and I'm doing it again, and I, as I have. And yep. this one signage law, and I keep going back to it, I'm still not getting, they, th there is a real impact that a $20,000 financial burden will determine whether or not a store remains open or not, whether a mom and pop shop can survive or not. Competing with big box stores, internet, consumer behavior changes is enough. But when we can't help them with the smallest, which is within our grasp and our power, I, there, there is a belief that this agency, this administration, is not here to help. This is going on 10 months, 10 months. And a simple moratorium would have helped before the reform begins. But I'm going to allow uh, Councilwoman Ayala to ask a question in the meantime. Good morning. Good morning, Ms. Kisa. I'm actually going to piggyback off of, of, of Chair uh, Joe and I's question because I wasn't going to ask this, but if in fact, I mean, and I'm assuming that the 6,000 rules and regulations is an estimated <coughs> number. Um, is there a mechanism for SBS to go back and review those rules and regulations to determine whether or not some of those rules and regulations are obsolete at this point and need to be revised? Yes, absolutely. So the Small Business Advisory Council, which is made up of uh, leadership from the deputy mayor's teams, from the regulatory agencies, we meet on a regular basis. We will continue to meet on, on a regular basis to um, better understand the existing regulations, to look at what more can be done to make them efficient and effective, um, and to uh, the chair's point, to ensure that businesses uh, understand those regulations as well. And who makes up the advisory committee? Uh, we can get you that list of the specific a small, members. A small business is a part of the committee, do you know? The advisory council that, uh, to which I referred is um, uh, internal to the city, so it's members of the leadership from the deputy mayor's teams and regulatory agencies, but the small business first report, the initial 30 commitments, was developed with recommendations and listing sessions from hundreds of businesses, um, and we regularly take in input from small businesses on regulations as well. And I can send you that list of the councils. Understood. Um, in your testimony, you mentioned that uh, micro businesses across the country have decreased, but in New York City, they've grown by more than 10%. What do you attribute that to? Uh, I would attribute that to the incredible market opportunities in New York City. We have um, a diverse customer base. Uh, we um, in the city try to make it as friendly an environment as possible for small businesses. Uh, we at SBS provide uh, very robust services to small businesses that can be in the form of educational resources, capital, help identifying workforce, um, help with contracting opportunity with the city for minority and women-owned business enterprises. So I would say that there are many business opportunities um, and uh, a great customer base in New York City and great services from the city itself. Now, I would imagine that if I was a small business that was starting up, it would be easier for me to connect to existing resources because I'm in direct contact now with SBS. But what happens to an existing business that is, you know, that has been around for 20 years? How do you get information about these resources to them when we know that they lack, you know, the uh, sometimes the technology to, to continue to stay up to date with what's happening? Absolutely, that's a great question, and it's one that um, we certainly grapple with uh, as an agency. Um, Commissioner Bishop, when he was appointed three years ago, um, and his predecessors uh, in this administration really um, made a significant investment in outreach for um, uh, SBS, both to new businesses that are starting up, but to your point, to existing businesses. So we have uh, seven <coughs> business solution centers throughout the city. Any business owner can walk into those centers and uh, get assess assistance accessing capital, get connected to the right business education resources, um, compliance assistance, all of the resources that I laid out in my testimony. Um, but we'll also go door to door with small businesses through our Chamber on the Go program. That's a program where we'll uh, walk into your store and do a very quick initial assessment with the business owner because we don't want to waste their time when they're in the middle of the day running their business. Um, but we just uh, say hello, tell them about our services, um, get a better understanding of their direct and most urgent needs, and then we'll contact them later and connect them with um, programming. So if you're a business owner and you say, 
Um, I've been in my neighborhood for 20 years. I've got a great service or product to sell. Um, members of my community know that I'm here. Uh, so, um, but I really need, uh, I really need to make an investment in fitting out my space. Or alternatively, I've been here for 20 years, but I want to grow my customer base, to your point. We can help you with marketing. And so we'll connect you to those resources that might be a class, it might be help um, with a loan application or connecting to a CDFI, could be regulatory assistance, could be any number of the services that we provide. But we try to do that on a schedule that makes sense for the business owner and isn't burdensome to them. So that's one way. We also have our mobile outreach unit, which is a new resource that um, uh, the commissioner worked with uh, the council to put in place. It's um, essentially a very fancy RV, but it's a vehicle that can drive right up to a commercial corridor and provide assistance to small businesses on the corridor or um, to job seekers in the neighborhood that might be seeking to connect with uh, an employer that's hiring in the neighborhood or really any number of our services. Um, and I could really go on all day, yeah. but the last thing I'll say is we uh, <coughs> also work with the 75 business improvement districts across the city um, to help support those bids. Uh, and we think that they're extremely strong key partners um, in supporting small businesses uh, and um, providing those services every day. So that's just a few of the ways that we connect with businesses. Those services, um, some are tailored to a business owner that's starting their business, but many are tailored to longstanding businesses. As I mentioned in my testimony, there's also the Love Your Local program, which is uh, keenly focused on longstanding businesses. Do you prioritize um, communities where gentrification has kind of taken you know, over and we, we've seen a, a number of small businesses that have been um, shut down because of you know, rising, uh, rising uh, rents? Do you prioritize those communities? Because some of those communities don't have bids. Yes, yeah, so what I would say is um, while our services are available to all businesses, we certainly prioritize our um, targeted outreach and strategies uh, to corridors most in need. That includes the support of bids, but to your point, also our chamber on the go visits, our mobile outreach unit visits. I will say that 70% of the businesses that we serve are outside of Manhattan. Um, so we, we do focus a lot of our attention um, on the outer boroughs. Uh, as well. Okay, I have one final question. Um, the uh, the love your local. Do you have an example of a, of a small business? Because I I'm I'm thinking I have a, a a record store that has been in my district in the East Harlem part of my district for over 40 years now, and you know they're not getting a lot of business these days, and actually considering um, closing um, in the next few years. How do you help a business like that through the love your local? Because it seems to kind of fit in with the type of business that you would be helping. But what type of resource do you have? Like an example of a, of, of a specific business that you have been able to help and how? Absolutely. So one, I'd love to connect with you after the hearing and ensure that we can connect with that business um, because I think there are a number of services that we provide. Love your local, the initial application period has closed. so. Um, but I'll say through the Love Your Local program more generally, there is the online map and there was the ad campaign to draw attention to the city's small businesses more generally. I think for that business, we can help them um, in any number of ways. One, we can help them with their lease through our commercial lease assistance program if they are experiencing a leasing issue. No, they own. They own? Okay. Um, so Love Your Local specifically is for renting businesses because we are, uh, we're through that particular program focused on um, businesses that uh, need that extra stability if they're renting their space. Um, but what I'll say, and we can get you more specific examples, is for example, the assessments for Love Your Local have included um, working with small businesses to under the businesses in the program understand their specific concerns. One that's come up time and time again is inventory management. So you can have a small business owner that's incredibly successful because their product or service is um, you know, just stellar and the folks in their neighborhood know them, but they just need that extra help managing their inventory mm -hmm. so that they can make sure that they're not losing um, any revenue, that they can reduce costs, that they're um, really managing that system. And that can be harder for small businesses that don't have that back office support. So that's one example of the help we've provided through the program or will provide through the program with the grants. Um, but also uh, we'd love to work with that record store business owner um, to connect them with all the other services we provide as well. Appreciate it, thank Can you. Council, do you know if that small business is complying with the signage laws? I assume that they are. I haven't heard any complaints. <laughs> do you think that small business could survive a $20,000 hit? 
Am I on the record? I don't. I mean, I would imagine that a twenty thousand <laughs> dollar hit is a is a is a huge burden for anyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilwoman uh, Rivera. Do you have a question? Yeah, just uh, so you mentioned in your testimony <laughs> that micro businesses make up nearly eighty percent of the businesses in the city. Do you know how many of them are storefronts? Um, I don't have that information in front of you, uh, in front of me, but I can get that to you. You mentioned that um, you believe that collecting accurate data is a vital first step, and you are considering uh, the creation of a storefront registry which would allow the city to collect better, better data on commercial properties. So, so you do have data, you just think that there's always room for improvement and you feel like maybe a new initiative to collect more data on storefronts would help your agency? Um, it would definitely help our agency and the city to collect more data on small businesses. Um, I know that that's a name for the mayor and the administration as well. Um, uh, our colleagues at Department of Finance can speak to some of the data that we already collect as a city. We had small business services collect data on um, the businesses that we serve in particular, but um, the city at large, I will say, does not have a mechanism at this time for uh, collecting information broadly from the small businesses, so um, we are supportive of, of the goals of this uh, bill to ensure that there are better mechanisms for data collection. I have a bill, it's intro 1049, and it would require that you complete an assessment of the state of storefront businesses in every community district in the city at least once every five years. I know that you do commercial district assessments, but they're not as frequent as I think they should be. And so um, that would enable us to assess um, the storefront businesses environment, the number and types of stores, vacancies and opportunities for increased retail diversity. So based on your testimony, I think you would be supportive of that bill. And of course, um, hopefully the, the chair considers hearing it very soon. Um, I, I do feel like the data would be extremely helpful in kind of understanding some of uh, what we see as commercial corridors that are really suffering. Mm -hmm. And I think that for us to not necessarily know how many storefronts there are in the city and also the legacy business piece is so, so important because we feel like sometimes those are the only businesses that are making it because they've been there for so long, but even those are shuttering mm -hmm. all the time and they're mm -hmm. breaking hearts in our communities daily. So I hope that you would uh, uh, support that, um, that collection of data, I think it's vital. And you know, in terms of the Love Your Local, when did that start? When did you launch Love Your Local? Uh, this past year. And so it's a, it's a closed application process. How many applications did you receive and how many do you, are you going to actually serve, I guess is my question. Um, so the, uh, the assessments have gone to an initial set of 50 businesses and we expect to award grants um, of up to 90,000 to 20 businesses. Um, but we're looking at ways to, uh, as we develop the program over time, take the learnings of that program and expand them further. I would say, I mean, if you, you get a lot of applications and, and depending on kind of implementation, which I know is always challenging, I, w I, would, I would ask that you consider, I guess, later on, just the rolling, a rolling admissions process for some of the businesses. I, I do feel this is, you know, a 365 day challenge. So, uh, and we're very willing to help you with that if, 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 you know, you need our assistance, you know, in our communities where we feel there are the most challenges. Much appreciated, thank you. These are grants, right, not loans? Yes, uh, Love Your Local is grants, um, but we do also provide low interest loans to businesses, but we, we also work with uh, our partners at Kiva to provide zero interest loans. So those are mm -hmm. technically loans, but they're crowdfunded and um, uh, businesses don't accrue any sort of um, deficit to using that or interest, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Can you elaborate on the commercial rent tax? you put in uh, your testimony? Um, yes, so our colleagues at DOF can elaborate on that as well, but the commercial rent tax effort was um, the administration's effort to uh, raise the threshold of the tax so that fewer businesses had in, in Manhattan did not pay this extra tax. No, what is the commercial rent tax? It's, it's a, was a tax that accrued to Manhattan commercial properties that the DOF could. So basically, a tax put on a geographic area within the city. 
Hi, I don't know if I need to um, be sworn in. Let me swear you in first. Okay, thank you. So raise your right hand and do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and answer honestly to council members' testimony today? I do. Thank you. I, I'm Karen Schlein, Associate Commissioner for Tax Policy at Finance. So um, I didn't come with the exact criteria for the commercial rent tax, but it's generally imposed on businesses um, south of 96th Street. You can jump in if I get anything wrong. Um, with certain uh, exemptions for other geographical areas, and the effective tax rate is 3.9%. So the legislation to which you're referring was our effort to um, reduce the burden of the commercial rent tax for small businesses. So the taxable threshold had been 250000 uh, phased out to 300, and we increased that to 500,000, raised out to 550, but only for small businesses. So the only small businesses get the benefit of that increase, and that's defined based on some income definitions uh, in, on the federal tax return. I think uh, under 5 million is considered small, and then there's a, another phase out from 5 to 10 million of income. So basically, it's a tax put on businesses that are earning more than a certain dollar amount within the geographic area part of Manhattan? Is that what it is? Well, the commercial rent tax is um, generally not based on income. It's based on the rent paid. But this new benefit for small businesses is only for those businesses below a certain income level. The other businesses above five million or above the phase out range of 10 million would still be eligible for the pre-existing benefit of um, base rent um, threshold of 250,000 phased out to 300,000. So folks below um, a, a large business, say 20 million in income with base rent below 250,000 would still incur no commercial rent tax liability. Who, who incurs the commercial tax liability? The tenant. And what is the threshold for this tax liability? Well, um, the, if their base rent is defined in, in the CRT is below 250000 there is no commercial rent tax imposed. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's no CRT in the outer boroughs and many parts of Manhattan. So above 200000 Above 250000 there and uh, there is a phase out in commercial rent tax liability to 500 to I'm sorry 300,000 that applies to all businesses no matter what your size and that was the law um, in totality until we enacted this new benefit for small businesses I think it was last summer I forget when it was enacted but uh, that benefit accrued to 2,700 small businesses the estimate. Um, with an average benefit of $3,600 in tax. But isn't this contrary to the issues that we're discussing now, that rent is too high? Why would we put a commercial rent tax on in addition to the, the rent burdens that small businesses currently have? Why is this still being applied? OK, I can't um, really speak to the uh, the politics of why it's applied, mm -hmm. I can tell you that the CRT did generate, does anyone, was it seven to 800 million? I'm sorry, I don't have the exact number. That's like an order of magnitude, so I apologize if I'm off by, by too uh, big a range. I didn't, um, but I, I can look it up and, and get it to you, Cynthia. Um, so it generates quite a bit of revenue, and um, the tax has been with us for many decades. Does anyone remember, was it? back to the 90s or but, even earlier. But to cl 90s. be clear, yeah. this administration removed the commercial rent tax for many small businesses in Manhattan after hearing that that was a concern for Manhattan No, it's not businesses. removed across the board. So now there's a threshold of... from small businesses. I'm right, sorry, so no. small businesses with base rents up to 500000 no longer have to pay any commercial rent tax. So the whole goal of this legislation was to reduce the tax burden for small businesses. It had existed under previous administrations, and we heard that was a concern from small businesses. So this administration, DOF, SBS, the mayor, worked to remove it so that it would no longer be a burden for small businesses in Manhattan. But the, the, my understanding of the businesses that would be subjected to the tax are where they pay more than 300000 in rent, correct? 
Well, not completely, because small businesses are exempt for up to now, as a result of our initiative, up to 500000 So if so they pay uh, up to 500000 Up to 500000 right. So if they, anyone that's paying more than $500,000 a year in rent in a geographic area within the city of New York, which in is areas, Manhattan, yes. right, is subjected to an additional tax, correct? I'm not sure what you mean by additional. The commercial well, rent tax is imposed at 3.9% effective tax rate on the taxable base rent, with the, which is a very complex definition. Um, but yeah, it's a Meaning because they chose to do business in the city of New York within the, the geographic limits and have, are paying more than $500,000 a year in rent, they are now paying a tax, uh, a commercial rent tax in addition to their rent. I just want to, uh, yeah. yes, the commercial rent tax is a tax imposed on rent. I just want to clarify, because I feel like uh, maybe I'm not being totally clear mm. about the sequence of events. So what we did this summer was not to impose the commercial rent tax, but rather to reduce it. But it's still so on the books. Yeah, we, we didn't eliminate it, we're well, but we my, reduced it with I'm a, a targeted um, mechanism mm. so that we could we studied the data, and we, we tried to target the benefit towards small businesses. So basically, it's still on the books, is my concern. Yes, we're the commercial rent tax is still on the books, still um, for, we're, larger we're hearing that for larger businesses that are in a better position to pay the tax, but for smaller businesses that could benefit from unless having they that may, revenue. Unless they pay more than 500000 the um, benefit is uh, phased, so 500 to 550,000. There's still a benefit from our initiative. There's um, still a reduction initiative. in taxes. Right, right, right. They don't pay at the full 3.9% effective yeah, rate. But they still pay. My point being is we've been hearing, <coughs> we've been having conversations about the rent being too high in New York City for our small businesses, for businesses in general, right? Correct? And here we have a commercial rent tax that is being imposed on businesses within New York City that are being overburdened by rent to begin with? I, w I would say uh, that mm. uh, what this administration did, um, and it was a significant step and a major step that hadn't uh, been made by other administrations, was to reduce the tax burden on small businesses. And we at SBS think that that was a significant measure. Um, there are still businesses that pay taxes, which reduce Not that revenue tax. This is to just a special tax. This is a tax based on rent. This is a tax based on your geographic location and the rent that you're paying. Instead of helping, you know what we say? We're going to punish you by putting an additional tax burden. This That's the point that I'm trying to make, where this administration, and overall, when I say government, is not a partner to small business. We are their burden. That if you imagine paying $500,000 in rent a year, and instead of getting assistance, we actually penalize them. And that's the point I'm trying to make, and that we're skating around. Okay. I, I just want to be clear that this administration removed a tax burden for small businesses. So while okay. some businesses are still paying this tax, we think that those businesses that were most in need of assistance, have rem we've removed this burden. We've launched Small Business First. We've, um, you know, increased outreach at the Department of Small Business Services. We've ensured access to our services is um, available to those most in need of those services. So, I think that we've taken significant steps to help small businesses. A four percent rent tax. There isn't a business that couldn't use help. They already pay taxes based on income in New York City. So the more they make, the more, the more profit they have, the more taxes they pay. To burden a business in New York City with an additional 4% on their rent is absurd. And we know that th this administration has reduced it. It needs to be done away with. The arguments that we hear are rent is too high. In this regard, it's not only the rent that's too high, but we're going to hit you with a 4%, 3.9, I'm sorry, tax burden, in addition to the rent being so high. That's the point I'm making. We really aren't focused, and we're not doing enough. We're actually part of the problem, not the solution. So 
I guess I continue. Um, you indicated that uh, DCA has reduced fines to small businesses by more than 50%. Is that number of violations or is that in total dollar amount? That's in, in fines. They reduced the number of fines. Uh, uh, the fines issued or the fines paid? The penalty, which, which is it? So. I'll get, I'll get you the, the specifics of that, but our understanding it's uh, it's the fines the paid. fines paid. Okay. So the dollar amount generated by fines versus the number of violations is the question that I have. If we're we're making a statement that DCA has reduced fines to small businesses by fifty percent, is that that we lowered the dollar amount that they pay and perhaps have increased the number of violations that are issued or? There is a comparison that needs to be uh, outlined uh, so we have a better understanding because businesses are complaining to me constantly about the fines that they're paying. That they're not, what was once perceived to be the cost of doing business can no longer be substantiated by the fines that they're receiving. Um, you indicated that the creation of a storefront registry when we think of micro business, when we think of small business, the, concept, the perception out there is the mom and pop shop. So this is the importance of actually coming up with this legislation. We actually define a business with less than 10 employees, which we most would assume is a small business. The current definition of under 100 employees uh, by the state versus uh, a small business, that is. The, and that's the same definition that the city adheres to, correct? Small business is one that has less than 100 employees? Correct. Okay. Um, the SBA definition can be as high as 1,500 employees based on industry. That's correct. So the purpose of defining micro business is so we have a better understanding of the type of businesses, in particular the mom and pops. You refer to a storefront registry. This should be unilateral. Whether you're on a first floor or the second floor because the rent is too high on the first floor, forcing you to conduct business out of a higher floor should not take them out of the equation. Businesses are making decisions on their location, not only geographically, but the level of floor that they're on so they can survive. Cutting out of the equation a small business because they should be on the third floor, they should be a very small boutique company or firm, that statistic is vital. Do you want to elaborate a little bit more on the storefront registry and why not just a registry of all small businesses regardless of where they're located on what floor? Sure, so we think it would be useful to have more uh, data and information on all small businesses, whether or not that be on the ground floor or upper floors. We completely agree that many small businesses operate off of, um, uh, in, off of the ground floor, um, so more data there would be useful. Um, we're happy to discuss uh, the creation of the registry, um, collecting the information that, that you've outlined in the bill, but other information as well. Um, it's our aim at SBS that any mechanism that's created between um, the Department of Small Business Services, Department of Finance, and others in the administration is just not burdensome to businesses. Um, we don't want to create a whole other set of forms or mechanisms or processes that a, a business owner has to do just to uh, get at our aim of making it easier to operate your business. So that's our aim, but I think including um, uh, better data collection for small businesses, whether they be on the ground floor or not, is a, a goal that we share. And a vision on how we're able to get this information. Um, what are your thoughts? And I understand that you don't want another burden on small businesses where they have to indicate uh, the size, the revenue, the number of employees. I would hope part of that questionnaire would be, please, Give us your top 10 
complaints as to what struggles you have to keep your door open, as well as give us your top 10 help and assistance that we can provide to you to make sure that your doors remain, not only remain open, but help you expand. Um, one of the statistics besides that 50% of small businesses never make it to year five, which is a startling number, and that number is according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. We'd like to know why, and not all businesses are meant to succeed, but what forced that business to close? What could have we done to prevent that closure? How can we help with expansion, not just keeping your doors open? So I'll let um, our colleagues at GOF speak to um, the potential ways that we might use existing data sources and expand on those to um, create a registry. But um, I will say that through um, many of our community partners, through our business solution centers, through um, the small business survey that we put out with, um, with your help and the help of council, uh, we uh, have many mechanisms throughout the year every day to collect information from businesses on what their needs are, what challenges they're facing, and how we can best um, meet those needs. So again, completely share that goal um, and would love to collect more information on, on the needs of those small businesses to expand on those initial efforts that we have now. As we mentioned, the commercial district needs assessments, which are in targeted corridors, are really a deep dive on what challenges businesses are experiencing and recommendations from um, community stakeholders in those corridors. That's just one way we've done that, along with the survey, along with working through our community partners every time we interact with a business through our center. Um, so more data in that area would certainly be great. I just want to point out that businesses with fewer than five employees gained more than 31,000 jobs between 2000 and 2013, while businesses with more than 500 employees lost more than 5,000 jobs during that same period. And the, the reason why I focus on expansion is there is an asset, and it's a lot easier, although it's not low-hanging fruit, and we think of big numbers uh, for the obvious reasons, but the expansion of a pizzeria, I go back to that pizzeria that I'm gonna open up someday, um, expanding that from a single storefront to a double storefront, multiply that throughout the city, it's real job growth. Completely agree. Um, my statistics may be slightly different because I haven't done your, your quick math on this, but I have the micro business employment is 15% of total private sector employment um, in the city, so uh, that's extremely significant um, for New Yorkers, and we think growing and expanding small businesses is one of the um, greatest tools we have to ensuring access to economic opportunity for New Yorkers, so completely agree with you there. I know that you want to bring up the Department of Finance to actually help outline. Um, does SBS currently offer any programs specifically to micro businesses? Uh, all of our services are available to micro businesses. Um, and uh, I would say that a significant portion of the businesses that we serve are micro businesses. But not specifically toward micro businesses. You're, you're offering your services to all businesses, correct? We offer our services are available to all small businesses, but I do have the statistic um, close to 80% of our clients are micro businesses. Right, but so you don't have any. So if I had uh, 100 employees or five employees, 99 employees or five employees, you're going to provide the same services to me. We're going to provide tailor services that are most relevant to your pizzeria or your business, but um, I would say that, again, based on the statistics that close to 80% of the businesses um, that take advantage of our services are micro businesses, I think we uh, end up targeting and serving micro businesses in the, in the vast majority. Um, mm -hmm. I, we don't have specific courses restricted to micro businesses, but I think that we're, um, we're certainly targeting that market, but 
uh, we'd be happy to work with you to ensure that micro businesses are aware of our services. Well, I, I would hope not only target them, but actually come up with a comprehensive approach. Mm -hmm. If we recognize that they are the backbone, the true driving force of our economy in this city, then we need to tailor specific programs to their needs and services and not offer the same advantages to a much larger business. So if we're going to cater, let's cater to where the help can be most used, and that is micro businesses and come up with a program and services specifically benefiting that group. Um, 100 employees has a human in HR department, has a legal team, has certified public accountants, has all the infrastructures in place that need to help not only comply, but focus. Our micro businesses are the accountants, they are the HR, they're making the donuts and delivering the donuts on top of everything else. Because they don't agree. have those resources available. Um, so. Completely agree. I would say that uh, we we um, try to focus keenly on businesses that are most in need of our services. I think the statistics show that we are reaching and have services that are relevant to micro businesses. Certainly happy to work with you if there are needs that are not being met by micro businesses specifically. Um, I know that we do hear uh, from businesses across the city um, many of the same needs like access to capital, um, assistance with regulations, assistance with long-term business planning, which is not uh, always the the most interesting um, issue that comes up, but is, is very significant, like we mentioned earlier, that inventory planning, that planning for business growth so that folks can hire more employees so that they can expand their customer base. Um, so we do hear those uh, common issues, and I think that those are certainly relevant for micro businesses as well as larger um, businesses, but we are focused through Chamber on the Grow, through our mobile outreach unit visits, through um, where our business solution centers are located, through where we do outreach with community partners to really um, meet those businesses where they are and get to those who are most in need. Um, but certainly we'd, we'd like to work with you to do more. You currently don't have a number of micro businesses. We can't obtain that information currently, correct, through SBS? We um, collect information on the businesses that we serve, and we use the census county business patterns for estimates of the rest. And then, um, uh, as I mentioned, we work with our colleagues at other agencies for the information they collect. And the number of businesses that you help, you've estimated 80% of them being micro businesses, correct? That's correct, okay. yeah. Um, what were their problems that they defined or brought to your attention as issues which are determined whether or not they can stay open, whether or not there are burdens on them? Um, so some of the, the most common feedback that we receive when we go door to door or when we're out at outreach events or um, a business owner walks into a, some of our centers, uh, we hear about access to capital, we hear about uh, long-term business planning. Um, sometimes business owners uh, will more broadly say that they uh, would just like to increase their revenue, reduce their costs, which can come in many forms. Um, and then we hear uh, that a business owner is has a new lease, but they're not sure of all the component pieces of their lease, and we provide free legal assistance so that they can have a better understanding of their lease. So those are some of the, the issues that we hear about most often. Surprised none of them have brought up the attention of regulations and fines. I. As I'm sure you're aware, we do hear about compliance, um, but okay. we readily address that need. As soon as we hear it, we mm. have services. Have you heard about the signage law one? Uh, we have heard about the signage law, and we have been working with our colleagues to uh, address okay. those issues. Just circling back, making sure that remains a priority. So, and you've taken steps, I would imagine, to assist them on the issues that they brought to your attention uh, when it comes to some things that you can't possibly help. Perhaps you can help um, small businesses uh, in different ways, but to re increase their revenue and lower their expenses is a difficult one, I would imagine. It's a difficult one in the aggregate set of problems, but I think uh, there are questions that our team asks business owners to really identify um, the targeted need that they have. Uh, 
just going back to it because it's top of mind, inventory management may not be the first thing that a business owner says, but when you solve that problem, it can really help them to reduce their costs and um, thereby increase their revenue. Uh, if we're also helping them with their accounting or with their marketing, those are other ways that you get at the problem of um, cost and revenue, both sides of that, um, uh, that a business owner may be able to say, I have this issue, um, but I'm not sure what exactly is leading to this challenge. Can you help me to um, kind of uh, take apart those pieces and really address those needs? And we that's why we work one-on-one -on -one with the business owners to do that. So I have another proposal that I have to start working on based Great. on revenue and expenses. Um, the advantage of bulk purchase discount. So the pizzeria, although we have competition amongst pizzerias doesn't mean or prohibit the local pizzeria from working with another one so they can purchase products and benefit from bulk purchase product discounts and services. We could all buy flour from the same person and obviously if you order 10 bags of flour or a thousand bags there's a benefit there that, to that small business as well as something that we refer to always that uh, capital needs, but what if we propose a credit union where obviously the non-for-profit status applies, this would be very helpful to our bids, but also to our small businesses um, where there is a higher interest rate paid on deposits and there'll be a lower interest rate paid on loans. So if we're looking at increasing revenue and decreasing expenses, these two complement those specific needs of micro businesses. Um, I would love to take that back to our team um, and have further discussions. Uh, as I mentioned, on the capital side, we connect to low interest loans through CDFIs, zero interest loans through Kiva. Um, but those are interesting proposals, and I'd, I'd love to have conversations with our team and come back to you. Excellent. Where has the city been a constructive partner in helping businesses grow, small business or in particular micro businesses throughout the city? Where I'm, I apologize. Where has this administration or your agency been helpful in expanding of small businesses? Across the board. Give us some examples. Great. Um, so I think that we help small businesses to expand um, by assessing their needs, uh, connecting them to resources, um, and sort of uh, ushering them along and working with them along the way. Um, every business is, um, as we've discussed, as I know you're, you're a strong advocate for, is, is unique and has unique needs, but also unique strengths. Um, so a business may need help hiring, they may need help training their staff, um, they may be able to make that investment, or they may need more significant help from the city. Um, they could need additional equipment, better business planning, better processes, back office. Uh, it, it really is unique to that business ty by type, by owner, by circumstance, by where they are in the city, their commercial corridor. So we, um, we try to be holistic in our support. Um, we're very lucky at the Department of Small Business Services that we have a division that works with all small businesses, a division that works with minority and women-owned business enterprises, a division that really works to support the commercial corridor itself and bids um, and investment in community organizations. And then of course our workforce development team that works to train New Yorkers um, in new jobs. So we are able uh, within our agency to really uh, provide a lot of services, but also um, this administration has really focused on having agencies work collaboratively with one another. So we're able to go to um, other agencies and say, what, what resources do you have? Um, and our staff is uh, really well positioned to make those connections. So I think that um, we, we focus on businesses most in need um, and try to drive that equity agenda, but we do our work across the city um, and across uh, all of the business needs that a small business owner may have. So where have you or your agency not been able to Um, I think that we provide um, significant and useful services to small businesses. 
And I think that's so the request. There was just that they brought up. So where was it that, you know? But uh, our, our commissioner has made a significant investment in outreach, but where we do still have some work to be done is in outreach and ensuring that businesses know about our services. And in turn, if we're reaching those businesses and talking to them mm -hmm. and saying, um, we may have a resource that fits your need, uh, it's possible that we'll uncover that there are needs that we haven't met. But I think that more often than not, when we speak to um, a small business owner on Saturday when we were, we were out walking the corridor on Arthur Avenue, we, um, we hear from businesses that they need help with uh, capital or they need help with expanding their space or hiring or all these needs and we have those services and they may not know about them and that's that's a, a concern on our part and that's an area where we can do better so I think um, uh, outreach uh, is is um, a category where we can always make improvements we've made investments to improve there um, as I mentioned before the mobile unit chamber on the go all of that um, our outreach our commissioner walks corridors um, every week but it's um, we can always do more. All right, but th this is on outreach. I'm referring to the businesses that you've been in contact with. with. Bless yeah. you. Bless you. In particular, this Saturday, which was a, a real pleasure, walking uh, the Arthur Avenue, Little Italy district of the Bronx, one of the issues that was brought up, and we've heard this time and time again, uh, as a complaint from small business owners, is the enforcement by traffic agents and the issuance of tickets in an area where parking is limited. And I go back to that pizzeria that if you're going to double park and by the time you come out with that $2 slice and you find a $115 ticket on your car, <coughs> highly unlikely you're going to visit that pe or frequent that pizzeria again. The, in particular, the small businesses that we met on Saturday asked that there be less enforcement and actually helping with the traffic flow. So putting traffic agents on intersections versus just ticket blitzes. And it, I'm not sure if you picked up on it, but there was actually a chain of traffic agents following one another in sequence issuing tickets on Small Business Saturday. I, I did not witness um, that chain, but I will certainly take your word for it. Um, what, what I would say is um, the Department of Transportation uh, is, um, has to ensure that there is traffic safety for New Yorkers. Absolutely. We have to, absolutely. We have absolutely. to ensure that pedestrians are safe, that drivers are safe, um, and that people can move um, efficiently and effectively from one place to another. That, being, that being said, um, uh, we uh, work very closely with DOT when we, um, and with small business owners, to uh, make the connections where there are issues and where we can come to a resolution where there might not be um, a a safety um, concern or there's just an alternative way to approach a safety concern. So um, we <laughs> talk to small businesses and when we understand that there's a need, we work with our colleagues at DOT um, to better understand the options. Uh, and um, you know, we've, we've really noticed um, a culture in this administration for agencies to work with one another to, to try and support small businesses. So that's, um, we make that effort every time we hear about an issue. Right, effort, and that's what I brought to attention. Apparently, you're doing some great work out there providing services, uh, although I'd like to focus more on micro-businesses where there are specific packages of services and programs that are offered to this very <coughs> vulnerable but important group. And I'm bringing up traffic agents as something that is undermining business models and commercial corridors that have limited parking and when I asked what, I what are some of the issues that were brought to your attention by small businesses that you could not help with, this is one that repeats itself where it's very difficult, and we'll use Arthur Avenue, <coughs> which is no different than any other commercial corridor. There just isn't enough parking spaces. And by the time you make your rounds, the meter that you thought you'd be a half hour, wanna be in 32 minutes, 
subjecting you to a fine. It's not helping, it's hurting. And we understand the importance of safety. We should be looking at ways to work with our small businesses and not hurt them. And if they don't have small businesses that are being patronized, then of course they're looking for the box stores, which have ample parking, internet, where you don't have to leave the convenience of your home at all, <coughs> which undermines small businesses. So if we're going to be a partner, and these are just a couple of issues, and I'm certain this is not the first time you've heard them. What more can we do? Well, specific to um, the, the question about parking, Chairman, um, to Cynthia's point, we work very closely with um, our sister agencies to determine what is exactly happening in a specific corridor, and that's through um, specific door-to-door -door activity that we've done throughout the city with DOT, working with um, the agencies and the small businesses, and specifically asking them what are some of the challenges that they're having. So uh, there have been opportunities through that feedback where you know we've worked with DOT to either change um, some parking regulations or delivery times. We've worked with businesses to understand what delivery times work better for them so that we can work in turn work with DOT to, um, to help mitigate some of those concerns around issues like that, um, same as parking. Um, and it obviously, as you know, it varies from um, you know, corridor to corridor throughout the city, but we work very closely with, not only with our agency partners, but also with the small business owners to determine what um, is the most impactful and most helpful way to be able to help them in issues like that. Okay, so let's talk about helpful ways. We have just seen or we're experiencing an <coughs> increase in the amount charged for metered parking, right? New York City has just increased in the, throughout the five boroughs on certain commercial corridors the rate that you pay for metered parking. It's a fact, I'll take it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so now we have customers that are going to be paying more for parking and depending on where you are in the city determines the rate that you're going to pay, mm -hmm. there's an increase. There's a enforcement aspect to these commercial corridors yielding no assistance to our small businesses that make up these vibrant commercial corridors. And if we know it would be tragic and an epic loss to losing small business or our commercial corridors, mm -hmm. What should you be fighting for? Well, Chairman, as you know, we, we've worked closely, even with, your, with yourself in, um, in Queens, for example, where we visited some of these small businesses who have been impacted by changes in um, regulation or enforcement. And I think you know, we all think that part of um, helping to mitigate the concerns is learning from these businesses directly what's impacting them and them being, you know, there on the ground every day, they know a little bit better about their customer um, interactions and when their customers um, are going to frequent their their establishment. So I think, to um, I think we saw some success in um, working with um, our agency partners and learning from those business owners and having that walkthrough that we that you also joined us on in Queens and through learning what those business owners were facing, we were able to kind of change um, right. the, the issues there. So, w Which was a policy enacted by this administration, right? The one that was looking to help small businesses, right? Where they well, enacted the clear curbs uh, uh, policy where no parking, no stopping, no standing between the hours of 7 a.m. to 10 a.m., which destroyed those commercial corridors. Um, and it was a six-month pilot which yielded in store closures. Well, I a test <laughs> like that determined whether a business was going to uh, keep its doors open. And the test was a failure. It proved to be a failure. It did not have the impact to combat congestion. But at the cost of many small businesses, some which couldn't survive, 
and were forced to close, and many of them took a real hit on revenue that was lost because of that policy, that test. Well, I think where we, where we saw impacts to small businesses, we worked very closely with our agency partners to mitigate and change course in some of those areas. And I think that's going back to, to um, you know, what was earlier stated and how we help businesses when we, we do our best to learn what is impacting them and we um, work with our agency partners and those business owners to change course. Warren, I think that was an example. Those commercial corridors and those small businesses would have told you in advance, if you do this, you are in essence putting that final nail into my coffin. Please don't do this. They said it. They shared their concerns. There were bids that were involved. There were chambers that were involved. And yet, this agency put in place a program that destroyed small businesses as a test. The Department of Transportation is, um, is uh, directed and works hard to ensure the safety of New Yorkers. Um, and so mm -hmm. they uh, have to do that across the city in complex situations, and every commercial corridor is different. What I will say to your point is that the Department of Small Business Services um, convened business improvement districts affected by uh, those changes, um, and we spoke with small businesses, and we did uh, commercial corridor tours with DOT um, to better understand the needs, and we found DOT to be an incredibly receptive partner in better understanding the impacts to small businesses. So while it was a complex change meant to um, ensure the safety of New Yorkers, uh, we found our agency partners to be very um, willing and able to uh, hear feedback from the small business community um, and to enact changes where it wouldn't impact uh, the safety of so pedestrians where, and drivers. Where is your agency going to be the next time there is an implementation of a no parking or Street not road dieting is what we call it now. That means taking two lanes and making it one lane that is going to impact small business commercial corridors. Let's look, if we understand that congestion impacts our commercial corridors, we understand the limited parking impacts our commercial corridors. And I'm bringing it now to your attention what are you going to do to prevent this administration from further hurting small businesses by road dieting, narrowing the roads, removing of limited parking spaces? What, what we're all going to do as an administration is work for the good of New Yorkers. And mm -hmm. we're going to do that in two ways in our roles. We at SBS are going to do our job of understanding the needs of small businesses, collecting that feedback, um, being boots on the ground to better understand those needs. And we're going to take our responsibility very seriously to convey that feedback to DOT. We've found time and time again that DOT has, has welcomed that feedback um, and has been interested in receiving it. Their role and their responsibility is to um, ensure that traffic is planned, roads are planned in a way that um, is safe for drivers and pedestrians and public um, transit users. And so together we're going to um, work as partners to ensure that divisions are not um, decisions. But your, but your role is to help small business, right? So that means you've got to push back on DOT or any agency or department or policy that could have a negative impact on a small business, right? That's your role as SBS? Our role as SBS is to understand the needs of small businesses. Mm -hmm. It's it's not necessary. It, it is not necessary okay. for it to be an adversarial role with DOT because we have no, found no, them no. to be willing partners. No. But it's our role, absolutely to your point, to collect that feedback and to convey it uh, to DOT. I know our commissioner Warren, myself, take that responsibility extremely seriously, and we do that regularly. So we um, we work with uh, our staff and our agency partners, community boards, um, or community, well, community board CBOs bids to understand the needs of these small businesses, um, and we work with DOT to convey that feedback. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, they've, they've uh, always been willing partners, and um, we will continue to, to share any issues that we hear of. So 
we have a particular canal used in U.S. form bid Morris Park. You have a bid. You have a chamber. You have a viable commercial corridor. You have limited parking. You have aggressive enforcement by parking uh, traffic agents. There is a proposal against the will of those small businesses, the bid, the community where there was a thousand signatures sign a petition as they begin the discussion of road dieting and the impact that it will have on these businesses. This was brought to your attention and you say you share it with DOT. At what point do you say, hey, my role is to be at the forefront of the issues of small businesses and I have to stand by them. So fighting for them, that's the point I'm making. Whether it become regu regulation, taxation, enforcement, if, we're, if your role is to help small businesses stay viable and expand, this is paramount to a commercial corridor survival. What is it that they should expect from small business services? I think what, to Cynthia's point, what they can expect is um, that we're going to work closely with the small business owners, the folks on the corridor, whether it be bids or merchant associations, um, and our partner agencies to make sure that, one, the, the health, and safe, health and safety of um, the commuters on that corridor and the viability of the businesses aren't mutually exclusive. Um, we think we can we think we can come to a place where we can serve both those constituencies. Um, it's important for even the business owners to make sure that their customers feel safe coming to their businesses, and that shouldn't the way that's implemented should not impact the business owners. And what we've done in every every corridor that we've that we've um, We've, t we've worked with our sister agencies to do this is we've spoken directly to those business owners to learn what their needs are and we've tailored those specific needs to that corridor to the best that we can as um, partner agencies. So that business owners can expect that we're gonna listen to their needs and their concerns and we're gonna work very closely with our agency partners to help mitigate those concerns. So it goes back to my question that I had and that's why we had to go down this path. It's like again, like pulling teeth. You're doing a great job, by the way. Um, Thank you. Of holding your own. When I asked what is it that SBS offers in the services, you elaborated, and those are some wonderful programs. And I said, where have you had difficulty in helping small businesses with their issues? And you talked about outreach, but we circled back to some of the issues that have been brought to our attention and the difficulty it is for your agency to help. These are real issues. These are environments that have made it very difficult for these small businesses, that very group that you are fighting to help. Morris Park is asking for large community parking lots. And they've been asking it for a number of years. Morris Park has asked for angle parking because of the limited parking options. And this has been going on for decades. What Morris Park is now faced with is road dieting, which is counter to the needs of that commercial corridor. We need to do more, we need to be more proactive, not only here, but actually help these small businesses as they bring these issues to our attention. And this is not unique to Morris Park. This is many commercial corridors. And using Queens and Brooklyn, which were that pilot that destroyed, literally destroyed those commercial corridors, is tragic for many of those small businesses that will, may not be able to reopen again or were forced to relocate, to get out of the no curb, no parking zones, and that pilot. We're not doing enough. I 
keep reiterating, we may be a part of the problem and not the solution. And although we are offering services, they are not enough. I believe that we, as an agency, are being proactive in reaching out to small businesses. Um, I completely agree with you that that's necessary, and I think um, I think it's being done now. Uh, we reach out to businesses, we work with them, we work to better understand their needs. Um, there are trade-offs in government. Uh, there's there's health and safety. There uh, works for transportation planning and for compliance and regulations. That being said, this administration really works together across agencies to say where there are inefficient uh, regulations, where transportation can be planned differently, where there are not health and safety trade-offs. Let's take a serious hard look um, to ensure that we are uh, not being overly burdensome to small businesses. And I can say that, that we um, are doing that, that we have done that, that it is unique um, in the past few years uh, to make that effort. Um, that when we go to our agency partners and tell them that there are issues with small businesses on their corridor, that we can find folks who are receptive and interested in hearing that feedback. Um, it, it, is, it is not perfect at this point, and there will be times where the trade-off is uh, on the side of, of health and safety, and a small business may need to adjust in some way. I can commit to you as an agency um, that what we will always do is to proactively collect that feedback, but also to help small businesses to um, adapt and plan uh, where necessary for um, any uh, they challenges they plan. may need to confront. I, they cannot possibly plan and adopt to clear curbs. They just can't. You're taking away that, that program, 7 a.m. to 10 a.m., no parking, no stopping, no standing. 4 p.m. to 7 p.m., no parking, no stopping, no standing. There is no way they can prepare for that. At best, they can prepare the deliveries. But when it comes to their customers, which took a toll, um, and I reiterate, forced businesses to close. How do you prepare? How are you going to help that business prepare for that? In instances like that, the way that we help businesses to prepare is to work with um, the agency that's, that uh, is making okay. a change to um, reach the small businesses, to tell them that a change is coming, um, to help them along the way to adjust their delivery schedule, to your point, um, to inform their customers. Um, at the end of the day, if a change needs to be made to um, help pedestrians, to reduce congestion, to make other safety improvements, we as an agency and as an administration have to make those choices. But we um, at SBS will always work with those businesses to help them understand what changes are coming um, and adjust accordingly. Um, they didn't have much notice, and um, they brought that out to our attention, that they were not informed. They were informed days leading into the enactment of that policy. They had no time to prepare. We scheduled deliveries. And this is where the lock comes in, where we truly are hurting. But let's continue with the real purpose of this discussion about micro-businesses. Uh, if the regulations to go, what metrics would you, would be the most useful to track micro-businesses? Would it be number of employees, annual revenue, combination, uh, industry? I, I think all those. Uh, categories are um, pieces of information that it would be helpful for SBS to have as an agency. Um, again, we collect much of that information now on the businesses that we serve, um, but I can't speak to what information would be um, uh, most easily collected in a non-burdensome way. Well, in a non-burdensome way. We want to make sure that, um, as a city, that we leverage our existing data collection mechanism so that, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're not imposing a um, burdensome or, or, or onerous process on small business owners. So um, the degree to which we can leverage um, existing data collection uh, through um, the information that DOF collects or others collect, uh, you know, I think that um, this bill has, has uh, really been helpful in getting us thinking about the data that we collect now, um, and we're supportive of, of that goal. And so 
we would like to work with you to um, do that kind of inventory inventory and think about the best way to collect data in the future. Including consumer affairs, which issues licenses and permits, right, for small businesses. We can perhaps get that information from them upon renewals. Um, that is a, an interesting suggestion. I think mm. one we could discuss. With City the income tax, uh, which I would imagine would provide useful information, right? So it wouldn't be a real burden on that small business. Uh, checking off the industry, the number of employees. I think that's a, an, an interesting suggestion and we wanna work with our partner agencies to understand what's um, most feasible. Okay, so then I will look forward to, can, to actually meeting with you to actually discuss what agencies currently exist or what is potential regulation that we currently have that could yield the information that is going to be needed. Absolutely. Um, without putting a burden, and I agree with you, this would not be, it's certainly not my intent, um, where we put a burden on these small businesses that they have to indicate type of business, number of employees, gross revenue, um, and then if they don't comply by providing a survey that we hit them with another fine and violation, because <laughs> kind of in, the city loves to do that. We're in complete agreement. <coughs> we want to make it as easy as possible to collect the information. So uh, I think those two areas, as well as others that we can work on, would be very useful uh, and available to us, right? Agreed. To consumer affairs, to? Uh, I, I believe that the city does not collect this exact information as it stands now. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we'd have to work across the agencies to determine the best mechanism for collecting that information and also to your point earlier in the hearing, um, what other pieces of data might be most useful? Um, I think that the council can be an incredible resource. You are keenly aware of the needs of businesses in your district, and as, as I imagine other council members are, so um, it's helpful to uh, get an understanding of needs and other factors that may apply to a small business owner. And, and I just use consumer affairs knowing that licenses and permits expire. And to have them reinstated, perhaps one of the requirements can be, well, what industry, number of employees, so we can reinstate your license. It wouldn't be a terrible burden. It's just a couple of additional questions. With the slight caveat that not all businesses um, have to interact with DCA, so I think it's sort of thinking through these various, how everybody, each agency touches small businesses and ensuring we can get at micro businesses and ensuring we can get at those who um, are in various industries and have various interactions with the city. Okay. Well, I just want to thank you for your time, your patience, your input, and I'm looking forward to selling you my first slice of pizza when I open <laughs> that pizzeria. Well, thank you very much for your advocacy and for this. You can bring today. Juan with you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> thank you. It's on me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Hearings adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>